Word of God that will be coming to us is titled Living Together as One. Living Together as One. If you open your Bible to the reference text that was read to us, Psalm 133. At the very beginning of the chapter, the word of God gave us like an expectation of what is to come. Psalm 33 starts with the word behold. That means there is an important text coming after this. There is something that I want you to observe. There is an observation that I'm ready to present to you that I want you to take your time to notice that you do not rush over it. You take your time to consider what I am about to show you or what I am about to reveal to you. And what is it that the Bible in Psalm 133 is asking us to behold. is asking us to behold the goodness and the pleasantness of living together as one. If you look in your Bible, Psalm 133 reads, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together saying there is a great deal of goodness. There's a great deal of pleasantness when family live together as one. Husband and wife as one. Husband, wife, and children as one. Even the church of God as one. When we come together, we call ourselves brethren. How good and how pleasant it is to live together as one. If you have ever been in any you know, domestic uh, issue or family fight and all of that, and through the mercy and the grace of God, you are able to resolve all issues and come back together, you will understand the feeling before and after when you are still in the heat of the issue. And when by the grace and mercy of God, the issue passed away and everything restored back to normal, you know it feels good. It, it, the, the atmosphere feels differently. How good and how pleasant it is. Because of our time, we're going to just look at how good it is for family. The Bible says, brethren but I want to really break it down to the level of the family because the family is the core unit of the society. When there is chaos, instability in the family, it is going to affect the church. When there is no love, when there is, there is hatred and acrimony in the family, it will eventually transfer over to the church. So, why is it good for a family, for brethren, to live together as one? It is good because unity, oneness, is the heartbeat of God. Unity, oneness in the family. Unity, oneness between the husband and the wife between the husband, wife, and the children, between the church members as brethren in Christ, their unity, their oneness, their living together as one is the heartbeat of God. Let's open our Bible to John, the gospel according to John chapter 17. I'm going to read quickly from verse 20. This is Jesus here praying for us even before we know him, before we come 
to accept him as our Lord and as our Savior. John 17 from verse 20. I do not pray for this alone. He has been praying for his disciples all along. But at this time, Jesus took a detour and continued in his prayer, saying, I do not pray for this alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave me I have given them. That they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me. That they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. It's as if Jesus couldn't really get to say it enough. It's like you're just repeating yourself. That they, may, that they all may be one. That they also may be one in us. That they may be one. That they may be made perfect in one. Oneness. Unity. That this that have believed in me, I have prayed for them. But those who are going to come to me through their preaching, through their evangelism, through their sharing of the word of the gospel, that all of them together may become one. Live together as one because you and me, we are one. Father and Son oneness in unity and I transfer the same oneness to these ones that have believed in me and to the many more that will still believe in me and this unity this oneness is a signature of love when you look at the very last verse the very last statement there Jesus said and have loved them as you have loved me. He has been talking about oneness and unity and put a bookend of love to it. Oneness is a signature of love. Love is a signature of oneness and of unity. Let's again look at another scripture. Act 2 from verse 42 to 47. That was Jesus praying ahead of time for those who will receive the gospel. Act now shows us those who have received the gospel and the prayer being answered over them. Act chapter 2 from verse 42. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together. And had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily, those who are being saved. Jesus prayed ahead of time, Father, let there be unity, let there be oneness in these ones that I'm praying for, and even those who will believe me through them and will see 
the answer to that prayer in the book of Acts. That now all who believed were together and had all things in common together in unity, together in oneness. 3,000 souls. Just imagine the grace of God upon them that they do not need to be pushed or to be pulled or to be cajoled to just submit to love, to just lay down their possession that, yeah, I put my possession in the common purse. Let anyone who has need just come here and satisfy your need for the moment. We were talking this morning in Sunday school about husband and wife showing love and showing support emotionally, physically, and financially. When 3,000 people can come together and say, here is the access to my account. Here is my account number. Draw any money you want. Take here, here is my pantry. Enter into this place and eat as much as you, as you have need for. If this many people can do it, how come it is difficult for husband to know how much the wife is making and for the wife to know how much the husband is making? How can it be such a challenge for a husband and the wife to come together and, and say, here is our common account. Let all the salary go to account A. Then we create account B and account C for you. $50, we go there every month. $100, we go there every month. That is for you to spend as you see fit. You can go to ice cream parlor and just eat $100 worth of ice cream. That is what you desire at that time. You do whatever you like with that in your account B, in that in my account C. But all the money, no matter where it is coming from, it is coming to this account A. We just do, you know, monthly, monthly uh, transfer. $100 here, $50 here. Or if you like, you just withdraw the cash and bring it home. You, you, you put it in your wallet. So when you go about, you fancy something, you buy it for you. How can that be challenging? It is because there is no unity, there is no oneness. There is no unity, there is no oneness. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. Living together as one at the family level because that is the core unit of the church. If you and your wife, if you and your husband cannot come together and live as one, how would you be able to fit in into the church with hundreds and thousands of people? You're going to hold something back. That there's no two way about it. A man of God said a long time ago that if you cannot pay tight on a 10,000 windfall for you, you won't be able to pay tight on a $1 million downfall. $1 million downfall. Because you will, you will say, ah, if I put this 10000 down over this 100000 then when a $1 million comes, that is a whole lot of money. So faithfulness in little will give you the grace to be faithful when it gets to a bigger platform. If there's no unity, if there's no oneness, in the small unit of a family, there cannot be a full unity, a full oneness in a bigger body of Christ. Jesus prayed ahead of time. People that will come to believe in me, Lord, my father, let there be unity in their home, in their family, in their gathering. And we see how this unity, uh, the prayer for unity came to be answered. But we know that we have a common adversary. Let's look at 1 Corinthians and see how the apostles and the believers were able to continue in the doctrine of oneness. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 
read quickly from verse 10. This is Paul writing to the church at Corinth. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you may be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. In the same mind and in the same judgment. Paul appealing to them, saying, don't let the prayer of Jesus go to waste over you. Speak the same thing. Let there be no division. Be perfectly joined together. Let there be no divisions or uh, discord among you. Live together as one. Unity, oneness, it is the heartbeat of God. It is the plan and purpose of God for our lives. But it has to start at the family level. Husband and wife doing things in common. Husband and wife having the same plan, having the same purpose for the family. Husband and wife being there for each other at any time, in any situation, at any season of life. Why is it so important? Let's go back all the way to Genesis. All the way to Genesis. Because it is the heartbeat of God and God showed it to us as early as possible in his word. In his word. Genesis chapter 11 from verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. Everybody, they speak one language in one single way. And the Amplified says one expression. So if you nod your head, it means yes. I read somewhere that there are some communities, if you nod your head, it means no. If you shake your head, it means yes. So imagine if you go to that kind of community and they say, are you hungry? And you say yes. They will just laugh and move away. Say, this guy is full. He needs no food. Maybe day one, day two, you are still there. You cannot communicate. But they do a sign or they bring, they bring picture of food. They point to it. You want, you want chop? And you say yes. They will take the menu and they will laugh. Because to them, your nodding of head means you are fine. They might even say maybe it's fasting. It's our pastor. It's fasting. Five days one day it's going to come, you will tear the book and you put it in your mouth. Bring food. I want to eat like this. So, God in his infinite wisdom gave us one language, one speech, one expression. One expression. I was watching a documentary uh, about the animals and things like that and they said there is no one zebra. There, there are no two zebras with the same pattern of stripes on them. No two zebras with the same pattern of stripes on them. So also we human beings, even twin, twin, twin uh, ones, they don't have the same fingerprint. They don't have the same, something will be different in them. The, the look of their eyes, they are identical to us. But when you study them, you will see something that if you live with them long enough, that will tell you this is the first one and this is the second one. But God made language to be seen at the beginning, telling us that unity and the oneness of my people is my heartbeat. Is my heartbeat. But sin came and destroyed the unity. Because of our time, I won't have much time to really develop, but I'm going to give you the, 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 the summary of the message for today. Sin came. The Bible said that these people, they, 
they, they wanted to make a name for themselves and all of that. And God said, let us go and do what? And confuse their language. When God confused their language, that was when they began to organize themselves into different nations and different tribes. And then chaos ensued after that. God made everyone unique, but gave us one language so that we are able to live together as one. But sin came and took away the grace of unity. Sin came and took away the grace of oneness. And we have all this chaos and wars and bitter fighting and all of that. But we thank God for Jesus because in the salvation that we have received, the unity and the oneness is restored back to us again. What sin took away from us, the salvation that we have received restored back to us so that we are without excuse. We are without excuse to not live together as one because Jesus prayed that these ones, they may be one in all things. And we saw it at the beginning of the church how they lived together in oneness. The desire of God is that we live as one, grow together, and become better together. We live in an age of technology where the husband could be on this end of the seat and the wife could be on this end of the seat for four hours, five hours. They are not talking to one another because they are engaged in all of the social platforms. They are engaged in all of the social apps that technology has given to us. We need to recalibrate our lives. We need to put unity and oneness at the level of the family in the forefront. My wife, my husband, my kids, how can we know one another the more? How can we be better in our relationship? How can we grow together as one? How can we live together in oneness? Oneness in our time together, oneness in our finances together, oneness in our physical interaction together. And I pray that the Lord will grant us the grace in the name of Jesus. Many families are drifting apart. They just drift apart day after day after day. By the time they are 15, 20 years together, they don't even feel anything. Husband doesn't feel anything for the wife. The wife, I, I, I remember a long time ago where I used to live. The, the wife just bought a car that day and then overnight the car was stolen. And the following day, you know, everybody was saying, ah, oh. And I moved closer to the husband and, and I was trying to commiserate with him and say, oh, how did it happen? I mean, he was so nonchalant. It's like, I don't care. With all the trouble the wife will be going through with the insurance, with the, with the bank, with the loan and everything, he, he, he couldn't care any, any less because they have drifted apart. But we see them come out together. We see them go in together. But there is a gulf of gap in between. In between. So, for everyone in the house this morning and everyone that will listen or hear this message, it is time to recalibrate. Where is the, is the level of your oneness? When you've used a weight measure for so long, it will, it will be reading falsely for you. It won't come back to zero. It will probably start on five. So everything you weigh will weigh more than it should weigh. So they recalibrate and set it aright so that it can measure right. It is about time to set our relationship right so that we can begin to live together as one. And may the Lord give us the grace in the name of Jesus. It starts in the family, transfers to the church, and transfers to the society.
the Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. So that will bring me to the end of the sermon today, but whenever God gives me the grace again, we will expand on that, and then we will go to the second one. Why is it pleasant? Unity and oneness is good because it is the heartbeat of God, and we need to keep it on. That is why it is good. And why is it pleasant? We will explore that at some other time. Let us rise up to pray.